gonna play now? Bobby, I don't know. But whatsoever I play, it's got to be funky. One, two, three. Funky, funky. Funky cold. Funky, funky. Funky Politics Education Reform Series is presented by the National Civil Rights Museum, sponsored by Memphis Education Fund and Southwest Tennessee Community College. We'd like to thank our media partner, Chalkbeat Tennessee. We're going to have a bunk. are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. Myself here at D.C., Doc Ward, we're visiting this evening with Tamika Hart, yep. the Senior Program Officer for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and she focuses on civil rights inequities. And former school board commissioner of Memphis City Schools, you know, people go up the Go up the way and get famous. Well, they go up yonder? About, they go up yonder. They go up yonder. Yeah. Oh, I didn't go up yonder to get yeah, famous. get famous. You know, you know, she was famous. I ain't yeah. talking with her. Famous right here. If I'm famous, it's yeah. because of Memphis, but I don't claim, you know. Well, welcome to the program. Thank you. And, Thank well, you. Well, and, well, and welcome back. Thank you. I'm very yeah. glad to be here. It's good to have you here. Good to have you here. Good to be home. Thank you. Yeah, so you are in D.C. now. I am. Our nation's capital. Yes. And what type, with, with education, of course, as your emphasis, once again. Yeah. And what, what kind of work are you doing up there? So the the foundation, our U.S. program work, is focused on education um, reform. We work with a lot of organizations, different kinds of organizations, including school districts, um, individual schools, nonprofit organizations, all with the aim of getting more children to and through college, focusing that in the early years on high standards, great teachers, um, access to data, things of that nature, and then the college access and completion. So it's an, um, we look at it through the lens of equity, often just trying to make sure that the kids, all of them that are entering our school system, our public education system, have an equal and fair chance of success. So overall, just trying to improve the quality of public education. Yep. Yep. That, that puts you sort of at a disadvantage because there's so many people that are looking at public education as uh, something that's superfluous, you know, voucher programs and other things mm-hmm. and charters and other educational uh, opportunities that exist now. Uh, it seems like people are saying those alternatives you know, are better than public education. I mean, what would you say to that? Do you think that public education is definitely still a need for it and need to be enriched? Or are we looking at a system where, you know, we're going to start trying to pay for everything? So I I absolutely believe in the public education and the system of public schools. The public education system is the only institution that is mandated by state government. And so if you're going to mandate that children attend school, then you should make sure that the public schools that you run are the absolute best. So you can't stop in a, in a free country, a capitalistic country. You can't right. stop individuals from having private options. But if you make our public school system the best that it can be, then it should be able to compete with any other, other option out there. Excellent. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazukia Network. In our studio this evening, we're visiting with former Commissioner Tamika Hart of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You know... We, we hear this all the time, you know, that public schools are failing our children, yep. and, and it's and it's not necessarily so. But but why now? You know, we've talked about this on this show. It's all of a sudden now we've come to this metamorphosis that now public education is bad or the school is right. bad. I mean, was it bad 30 years ago and we just didn't know, Commissioner? So I was saying that <laughs> it. Um, if you look at data, okay. we can see that public schools are doing better now than they have in decades past, right? And so when you look at graduation rates, the graduation rate has increased. It has been steady for a long time. But it's, if you're talking about, I don't know when when is supposed to be, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, but we're certainly educating more children today and educating them better today. Are we educating them to a level where we can say they're all ready to leave high school, ready to do whatever they want to do, whether that's enter a career, go to college, you know, four year, two year, whatever they're trying to do. No, we have a lot of work to do there. The difference in back then and now is that as of 2001, 
we are actually measuring the performance of public education. And in 2001 is when we saw the enactment of the No Child Left Behind Act. So what was happening before then? Yeah. Well, we, we, we weren't measuring it. So we were just, you know, kids were coming to school. We don't know. You can't really, outside of graduation rate, we weren't really releasing data on how schools were doing. We probably, we talked a lot about maybe how systems did, how districts were doing, but No Child Left Behind forced us to take a keener look at not only just how schools are doing, um, not only how states are doing, not only how districts are doing, but how schools are doing and how they are doing for the different groups of students. You right? mean the individual, how the individual school environment is doing? Right, because we were looking at student data, right? right? So we began to look at student data by subgroups, so by race, right? We started yeah. then disaggregating data to see how our children were doing. And so then that led us to start comparing what, how... Black kids were performing against white students. So then we start seeing this disproportionality where we start seeing these gaps in, in, in performance. Then we started looking at how we are serving economically disadvantaged students or so our poor students. We start looking at how we were serving or not serving our special needs students before we didn't have that kind of data. So then with that data, then there started to be some somebody said we need to do something about this data. Right. No child, no child left behind. Um, try to, it's it, I would say force. Um, you know, they their intent was to incentivize schools to do better. If we start measuring what these things are doing, you know, but then the presumption was one. that is that it was so easy to incentivize them by saying all you need to do is perform at this level and that level. But there were certain uh, uh, impediments to keeping that school from ever achieving mm. certain levels. Right? right, right. Well, it wasn't. It was not um, addressing. The reasons that right. these things are happening. And that, right? I mean, sensitivities weren't taken into account. Absolutely not. And so then what started being what should have been a carrot became the stick. Right. And so accountability didn't become the thing that was the partner for us to improve schools. Right. So right. we didn't use that data to say, wow, this is happening at this school here are some resources to make sure that we're doing better. It became, oh, this is what's happening at this school, and those five teachers in that building are terrible teachers. Right. And so then we just start being a thing to punish. It became uh, fodder for the news, right? So every year when the report came out, which schools were on the list and what teachers were on the list. And, you know, and, and so then that brought about then a lot of the— Without any context or any regard right. for, that, for what that teacher had to deal with or what— type of students those that school had to deal with. Right. So it's a it's it's all it's a, it's so many variables, right? So yeah. you gotta look at how teachers are prepared, um, and, and what they know. We started later start looking at the cultural sensitivities of what is what it's like to teach in schools where there's high proportion of, of students who are poor and students who are of, of color. And so the, what are the community context? You know what? You know, so a, a friend, a close friend here in Memphis, you know, we're talking about when we start grading these schools. And it's like, so you want these schools to be in these communities that are struggling, but somehow the school is supposed to thrive. And so when you start looking at right. housing and transportation, things that are neglected in these conversations, you know, it was it, it made it difficult. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazookian Network. We're visiting this evening with Tamika Hart, former commissioner of, of, on the Board of Education, Shelby County, Tennessee. Oh, Memphis, Tennessee at the time, I think, right? Yeah. She's with the Bill and Melinda Gates Memphis Foundation. Memphis and then Shelby County. Yeah, Memphis and then Shelby County. Yeah, we yeah. ain't going to talk about all yeah. that interim stuff. In- <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> That's another show. You know, we, we talk, we've talked to a lot of folks on this program about education, reform, um, how do we right size a system that was built to for the industrial age, but now we're in a technological age, a scientific age. And, and we come back to this thing, Doc, what we've been talking about before. It appears that this new reform is really packaged stuff from when we were growing up as maybe small lads ourselves back in, I'd say, the 70s, maybe, you know, 70s. I wasn't 60s. a lad when you were a lad. <laughs> I was born in six, whatever. But but my point is, is that, you know, you're, you're bringing in folks into the district, uh, in these districts around the country uh, to address some of the socioeconomic needs of the students other than the education model itself. So it, it appears that and then you, it appears that we are going back to bring something out that's new. That's always, always been there. But we're trying to. I don't know. I mean, just I mean, it just seems like something we've um, done before. I, so. Other than other than the model of trying to, I mean, this this trying to put an effective teacher in front of every child, which they deserve, no doubt about it. But I remember back in the day, I had some pretty effective teachers. I thought, 
Miss Davis. But I think what we what we talked sorts. about is that you know, with no child left behind, yeah, it was created out of a real context and understanding of what the what was going on in the communities anyway. Right. Yeah. Well, and so and so I would say with with you know certainly mm. with its flaws, right. I think one thing you know to be celebrated is that it forced us to start looking at how students are being served or not, mm-hmm. and before now. Before 2001, we yeah. just don't know, right? Like, we all said, oh, all of our teachers were great. I would like to think my teachers were great. But right? is there not any way to measure that? Because yeah. before you had, at least I know in our system, teachers got evaluated. You know, you'd sit there and you'd go to school and you'd have somebody sitting in the back. You know who that was. <laughs> yeah. But they had these papers and they'd sit there and they'd mark the stuff and they'd evaluate the teacher on some type of criteria. Well, well, so I would, so I would say this. Mm-hmm. I, I taught school for five years, mm-hmm. right? And I'm also an employment lawyer. So I've also okay. worked with HR directors of you sure. know some big companies. And sure. one of the things that give you the least data is often the evaluation system. Mm-hmm. Often people are not good at it because people don't tell. It's easier just to, to put people at three, right? If it's one to five, it's easier to go with three. It's easier to go with satisfaction. Mm-hmm. And what we have learned, and teachers agree. Now, teachers will, you know, many will say, how we've gone so far into the evaluation, how we use it. Again, you know, some feel like as a weapon versus as a tool. Right. They would say, it. you know, we've gone too far. But many admit that the evaluation that they had didn't help them, right? So you have someone, you know, admittedly, my first year of teaching, I remember my evaluation, and my principal did come into the room. It was, right. you know, kind of late in the year, came into the room, and I got a satisfaction, you know, right. I like to think I was a great teacher, but what I didn't get was data on you were great on this part of the instruction oh, on see. this method. But mm. what you didn't oh. do was this. Right. The and so, so I didn't I don't get. know really oh. what that means to say I was sad. You know, I can tell you right now, I taught pre no child left behind. If you ask me, what am I going to say? Yeah. Oh, I was an excellent teacher, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but I don't know the connection between my teaching and what my kids learn, and, and I was a high school, te- I was a middle school and high school teacher, right? I don't know if because of my teaching, my students left me and were ready for the world. I would like to think so, but there's nothing that I can show you. That, well, that working off that. what you're saying then, because you had teachers in the same system that were considered to be good teachers, just considered mm-hmm. to be by some criteria. Mm-hmm. Those teachers went up through the system and became administrators. Those administrators went up and became executive administrators. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then maybe even the chief executive administrator. So you're saying then that you have people that have the possibility before this no child left behind to go from a unevaluated situation all the way up to the point to where they're making decisions on the system. And their sufficiency or proficiency as teachers in the system was never really challenged. Yeah. Well, and I, well, I won't say it was never challenged, but I can't we don't because we weren't measuring it in the same way. It's hard yeah. to say whether or not they were effective. Now, I would say teachers will argue and there's some you can agree with this and, and to some extent that mm-hmm. even now what we've done, even though we have more data, we still don't know. Are we still evaluating them in the best way to communicate? Here's what you need. If we're not tying it back to instruction, mm-hmm. if we can't tie evaluation back to student achievement, Right. It can't just be a, something you come in the room to do and say, hey, Mr. Ward, you were good or not good. And then there's no kind of professional development that follows right. that. Right. And it shouldn't just be about highlighting where a teacher is not great. Right. Mm-hmm. Because nobody is going to be good at everything. Right. But when you look at so the rubric, you know, to look at instruction, to look at planning. Right. To look at how you connect to students. If I come into that room, I'm the evaluator. If I can't come back to you and say, Hey, Daryl, this is what I saw. You did good on these things, and that was great. And if you continue to do this, it's going to lead to this many yeah. students doing this. But here's where you were not so great. Here's what I saw. Here's what you could have done instead. And, oh, by the way, here's some examples. So basically but, with no yeah. child left behind then, I mean, evaluation is relative. The people before no child left behind will say, well, we had enough. And the people afterwards will say, yeah. we needed more. But the, the bottom line is, is that you got more data now. And you should have more data because the school's been around longer. Absolutely. You're able to evaluate teachers, students, schools, every aspect of education in a much more uh, thorough way right. than you did before. Absolutely. And there were supposed to be incentives put in place to take schools and teachers and students to a higher level. But then through the process, the connotation came out kind of negative the way the, the program was rolled out. So then all of a sudden, instead of having these schools getting an incentive to 
go higher. No Child Left Behind became a situation where schools were looked at as failing school, failing school. You need to be taken over. You need to be taken over. Right. Well, because also there was an there, it was a disincentive to do better. It was actually an incentive for states to lower standards mm-hmm. to meet, you know, whatever yeah. No Child Left Behind. You know, because again, <clears throat> there was no requirement of standards. Now that's a race to the top conversation that we can have right, on that. Yeah. But bef- under No Child Left Behind, it was just you have to meet on your own state test. You have to have a percentage of students that pass the state test. So then states were dropping their standards. Wow. I mean, and just lowering. The, you know. And everybody was just teaching enough to pass the test. And so the objective of education is no longer about trying to reach the child's mind. It's about getting you over to pass the test. And, and just a quick example of that: in mm-hmm. Tennessee, under No Child Left Behind, in Tennessee. You know, we were ranking students, uh, schools, I'm sorry. We were ranking schools in districts. So right. certainly districts on an A through F report card, mm-hmm. right? And consistently, uh, the former Memphis City schools was like Ds and Fs, right? right? A couple of Ds, a couple of Fs. Former Shelby County schools were all As. Yeah. It took Superintendent Craner Cash, former Superintendent Craner Cash, to challenge the state's formula. And it's like, I, wanna, I don't know what your math looks like. Right. When they produced the math... An A for Tennessee was a 52 or above. I mean, a 55 or above. 55 out of 100. It was whatever the lowest score was of the county school. And, and then that's where the A will start. And Shelby County <laughs> and at that time didn't have a grade above a 60. Wow. As a matter of fact, I will never forget it. Their math score was 55. Memphis City Schools math score was 40. Now, I'm not mad and I'm not bragging about 40. Yeah. But there's 15 points yeah. between perfection yeah. and failure. Mm-hmm. And we fell for it. And so that's what I'm saying. So it lowered these standards. You know, your hurdle is not that big to cross over because we got to have some schools that are looking like we're making A's. And then we keep running with that. It sounded like you gra- like they graded on a curve versus grading it on a No, that's a bigger than a curve. Good Lord. Yeah, that's like I, a hook. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. When you think about it, it's yeah. like we got to deep so low right. to say that we have some schools that are passing. And at that time, the best school district in the state, I remember the highest score was like an 86. So nobody was even really in the 90s and making 100. Right. Nobody was knocking it out the park. Right. So to do that, you can do that on the No Child Left Behind, and so we were cheating the system. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazookian Network. In our studio this evening, we've got Tamika Hart, the Senior Program Officer for Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Civil Rights Inequities Division. Funky Politics. This is the story of a great people, of hopes and dreams, of challenge and change. It's an American story. The story and struggle that started many centuries ago lives today in the halls and on the walls of the renovated National Civil Rights Museum. Enter the Supreme Court Halls of Justice, sit with Rosa Parks on the Montgomery bus, hear Mahalia Jackson sing at the March on Washington. Plan now to visit the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. For more information, log on to civilrightsmuseum.org. Hello, I'm Uncle Howard. Jennifer Conroy. I'm Larry, the fantastic Robinson. Your host for R&R on Sports every Saturday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central on the SportsByline.com network. Get after us. We look forward to having R and R on sports, part of the Kazookian Network. I'm Michael Rawlings, and you're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazookian Network. I'm stronger than a locomotive. Yeah, that old saying is true. But I can't understand sometimes, baby, why I'm so weak for you. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazookian Network. And on this evening, we are visiting with Dr. Kent McGuire, President and CEO of Southern Education Foundation. But before we get to Dr. McGuire, I want to make sure you all know that always sitting here, uh, just uh, God, he's just a wonderful person. I, I can't say more, any more about him than he's just wonderful. Doc Ward, how are you, sir? I'm fine. Oh, God. I just built you up and you just said you're fine. That's oh. all I need right now. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> and we got a special guest host, Laura Kebedy, correct? Cabetta, but that's okay. close enough. I'm sorry, Laura Cabetta, uh, reporter with. See, Talk I knew Beat. if I let you talk long enough, <laughs> hey, I'd screw something up. <laughs> you gonna give me some entertainment? That's why I just said I'm fine. Whatever. It's like, I'm, I'm gonna wait to watch him just botch this all the way up. Laura Cabetta is sitting in with us today, and we're gonna have a great time. And Doc, welcome to the program, Doctor McGuire. Thank you very much. Happy to be with you. 
great. Did great. you introduce Dr. McGuire? I did. I, I said a lot of great things. Well, no, I tell no, you, you well, why don't you introduce you Dr. Did, McGuire? You, you didn't introduce Dr. McGuire. He's a great you guy. You, you just said Doc McGuire. No, I said he was the president and CEO of okay. the Southern, I just edu- to make Southern sure Education Foundation. You were Magic Johnson and everything else. Oh, God. See, <laughs> Dr. McGuire, this is what I put up with here in the beautiful studios atop the 18th floor of uh, LPI Studios in, yeah. in the heart of um, Middle America. Melamare? You're up to it, man. I think you're up to it. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm full of it. I think I'm... No, but anyway. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Dr. McGuire, you, you know, you've had a storied history in education. Uh, being a former uh, dean of education at Temple University, a uh, tenured professor, um, an assistant secretary of, of, of edu- U.S. Department of Education, and now you're in Atlanta running a think tank on, on education with an emphasis in um, bring it, I, I like to say bringing all boats up in terms of education, especially in our urban sectors. Can you tell us a little bit about the Southern Education Foundation and its vision, and your vision for it? Uh, thank you for that. You know, um, Southern Education Foundation um, has been around for quite a long while. You know, we'll be celebrating uh, being 150 years old oh, next wow. year. Not that many people know that about us. Um, yes, we're a think tank. Um, uh, we're known for uh, uh, careful analysis of the facts, speaking truth to power, uh, but we do things, too. Uh, we're a convener in the region, and we support a growing uh, menu of uh, leadership development uh, efforts. I could say more about that, but uh, those, in a nutshell, are the three things we do. Wow. Uh, so you all have been around since Reconstruction. <laughs> well, he's not going to say he's been around. Reconstruction. Yeah, I mean, he's exactly right. right. And so at the time, um, I mean, what's where is your emphasis? Because we're a Southern Education Foundation, and, and the South means different things to different people. So what's what's your region, your target area? You know, we make the region large or small, depending mm-hmm. on what we're trying to do. Uh, our work in higher education, we've used a big map. Um our work in um, early childhood and pre-K, we've tended to make the map small. Um, we're about to launch some new work that's community and district-based, um, and then the map will probably vary over the next four or five years as we pick groups of communities to work with in a kind of concerted way. So, um, But the American South, you could think of it uh, as our, our sort of general region. And so what's your connection to Tennessee? Um, uh, you know, about a year and a half ago, we did a fair amount of work with the, um, the Urban League affiliates in Tennessee. Uh, this was back when the state was debating uh, if it wanted to embrace, it has backed away from this, the Common Core Standards. Right. Uh, we felt that uh, low-income communities and communities of color needed to understand what the standards were uh, before they decided whether they wanted to embrace them or not. Uh, And so we did a fair amount of work in Tennessee that way. We have also worked over time with historically black colleges and universities. So Lemoyne, Tennessee State, and others we uh, we've worked with in various ways. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazookia Network. We're visiting this evening with Dr. Kent McGuire, president and CEO of Southern Education Foundation. I'm glad to hear you just say that, Doc, that that your your, your think tank, your foundation, has worked in Tennessee and uh, some other southern states, but especially on the the collegiate level. And hopefully, and I'm assuming that hopefully, is that at some point we can retool some of these schools of education because we've talked about this on the show before about the agrarian style of education that we're still under from the early industrial time but it's got to at some point it's got to change when do we go there when do we start the metamorphosis of a new system of education and hopefully that'll bring up our our, our, our urban our urban sectors i think that that is um on the horizon i literally left the meeting i left to get on the phone with you all was about uh, a sort of a change and innovation agenda in um, in teacher preparation focused particularly on minority serving institutions so um, I, I think 
I think, you know, within the next year or two, you're going to see some things surface that uh, we've been waiting some time to, to occur. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. But let's, let's, let's just get down to it, though, because this is funky politics. And and I think everybody's trying to be nice about it. We're defining. I mean, I just, I mean you are. I mean, uh, oh, is that a nice? Yeah, yeah. Nice you, you start out. I, hey, I'm a year. former dean. You know, I have to. You know, it takes me a minute to warm up. Oh, you know, okay, well. the teacher education. Well, issue. well, we will. Hey. This guy did three education years, leadership. Yeah. Three years well, of recovery what. for every year of service. Well, I will tell you what, we're gonna microwave you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we go, we go, I want to broil him. We, broil this guy here. We, we go cook start, quick. We go, we go cook from the inside out. There you go. Okay, there we you go. Start. All right. Well, give me an issue. There we go. There All we right. go. Okay. Here's we've had uh, you know this show about education. We've talked about it with several people. We know that there are issues in education reform, but that's such a big subject matter. Yeah. When when we talk about the most important value to education reform, what is it that we're really focusing on? Is it you know whether or not teachers are proficient? Is it the way that education is delivered in a K through 12 situation? Is it the number of teachers versus the number of students? Is it curriculum? What is the number one core issue that you all are dealing with right now? Well, we we don't think you can just pick one. Right, but what gets what gets uh, the goal today? If that, if one had to get the goal today, and we can work on the silver and the bronze. Yeah, well, you know, you got to start with the quality of teaching. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, you don't have anything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you've got to get quickly to, you got to start early, mm-hmm. uh, which means that, um, you know, you, you know, early education right. matters. Right, right, right. Right? Uh, and number three, uh, you got to focus on the whole child, not just the academic part of the child. We spent the last 10, 12 years coming to discover or realize that in the, uh, you know, in the reform community. Mm-hmm. And finally, um, if there's no money in the system, uh, you know, that's a problem too. We've been talking as if uh, it doesn't matter at all. Um, but if it didn't matter, you know, they wouldn't spend fifteen thousand dollars a kid up in New York City. Right. So, uh, right, right. you know, so it does matter. So those things mm-hmm. all matter. Okay. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. We're visiting with Dr. Kent McGuire, President and CEO of the Southern Education Foundation. You know, looking at those four points you're talking about. Do, oh, four, no, go ahead. Well, I mean, I just wanted to basically jump in there. I saw something. We. we Everybody's talking about the quality of teaching, and it, it appears, and it sounds like you've been around education, I'd say at least over 20 years. I'd say yeah. over 20. You sound like a real young guy here, but I'm-, I'm I am a young guy. Yeah, Thank I'm, you for saying that <laughs> But he's but, aged in education. But he's aged But I'm aged aging rapidly. That's aged. true. <laughs> no, aged. You know how to say aged. It's oh, aged. God. We, this guy, you know, he, he's a lawyer. <laughs> he's yeah. a lawyer out of Texas. So, but, he, but you know, Dr. McGuire, my, I guess my question is- is and we've talked on this show before right. that the new reform appears in in our area like we're going back to some old tried and true things that, that back in the neighborhoods you know right. back in the days when we're folks cared about stuff rebuilding and, the old yeah. educational community model yeah and but we're using grandma's deal in, in the neighborhoods mm-hmm. that we were growing up in prior to segregation right. how we were getting it so right then and now it appears that it's gotten so wrong I mean where are we at doc or where did we go wrong? Yeah, where did we go wrong? Where did we go wrong? Just though? out of your few years you've been in education, that's all. So I actually think where we've gone wrong, uh, my, my interpretation of the problem is, is that, A, uh, you know, we've got kids with many needs and challenges uh, that schools aren't good at meeting. Uh, if you can't read, if you can't see, if you're hungry, um, uh, if you've got a set of health and wellness issues that imp- they'll, they'll impact learning. And we've, we've made the assumption that uh, in the recent reform efforts that those aren't problems. That's number one. Number two, we've assumed that the problem is about governance and control. You have in Memphis, uh, the state took over. Part of the district created yeah. its own. What was it called? An achievement district. Yeah. Achievement, ASD. achievement school district. Right. Yes, that's right. 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 And right. Um, and it turns out that if all you focus on is uh, governance and control, but not teaching and learning, 
you might not actually get better learning outcomes. So that's uh-huh. been a problem. But they will tell you, and I know we've interviewed folks in the past, they say that they focus on more issues than that, and they're actually in in the homes of the students that go to the schools to some degree mm-hmm. actually working with them. So is that is that different from what you have what you, what what you knew about ASD or is it that they may not be at the same level of intensity or or what? I think that's what I I give them credit for it, and I would argue that's learned I mean, behavior. They yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, they they, they did say that's learned behavior. I, I yeah. bet they didn't learned start behavior. there. Is all I'm saying. Right, 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 <laughs> yes, right. Yes, yes, they, they've evolved. That's all I'm saying. They've evolved. Wow. So right. what are you talking about? And, and that's good. Right. Uh, right. It, it would be a real problem if we weren't learning uh, from our sort of initial assumptions about just how simple <laughs> getting better results is. Right. Turns out. Uh, it's not that simple. So the fact that they are learning and are using what they're learning to improve what they do, I applaud that. Right. But what they did, but what I think they have said, though, is um, because we recognize that with them operating off of the same dollars that go to the school system, you know, as a whole, that does create an impediment for the school system to do its programming. So what, but what they, in essence, said was that, you know, of course, because they exist, they actually serve sort of as... Uh, the impetus for other programs like iZone and things that are district created to come along and exist. So they're they're looking at themselves sort of as an instigator of the success change, of the school, an yeah. uh, instigator of change yeah. uh, in the school system. You know here, but I do I actually think point. that's fine. Mm-hmm. I actually think that's fine so long as it's true. Yes, <laughs> some competition probably helps things along. With right? that little caveat, so long as long as it's true. so long as that's true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. We're visiting this evening with Dr. Kent McGuire, president and CEO of the Southern Education yeah. Foundation. He just got microwave. Now he's wow. Really now, now we got him on broil. Yeah. We're going to get you on broil here in a minute. Yeah. We're going to get him really excited. <laughs> he's, he's like that piece of tinfoil in the microwave. Oh, my God. He's on fire. <laughs> this guy's on fire with him. Well, the other thing that, you know, that people talk about when it comes to teacher quality, that, I mean, there's different different definitions for that. So how does the Southern Education Foundation look at teacher quality? Well, what we so the first thing we would say is this, um, that a quality teacher is someone who's actually been educated uh, to learn how to teach. Hmm. Uh, look, um, you wouldn't go to a doctor that hadn't been to medical school. No, no, and I have been to You place. wouldn't go to a lawyer. I don't think you would have been to law school. You wouldn't go to an architect who could only say, well, I don't know anything about architecture, but I spent last night at a Holiday no, Inn God. Express. You just wouldn't do that. Right. Right. I play with, uh, So I play why with would TV. you want to be in a classroom right. uh, with folk who hadn't <laughs> been taught how to teach? But how does that happen? Well, they got to go to two things need to be true. One... Uh, uh, they need to be in preparation experiences that um, are strong. Right. And two, uh, they need to have demonstrably more time in real schools and classrooms than our current programs offer. I'm not saying that the way we prepare teachers is great. There's a big uh, hill to climb there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not rocket science. Yeah. All right, right, right. Well, I guess, and that's the question, because teacher preparedness, we're going to focus in on that. And you were saying, of course, you know, you wouldn't send your, uh, you wouldn't go to a lawyer with no license and so on and so forth. But how do you get to the point, how do we get to the point to where teacher quality declined so much? Was it because there was a lack of emphasis or in the teaching profession or, or what happened? I mean, why, how do we get to that point? Because once upon a time, it seemed like we always had quality teachers. And now, right, that's right, an issue. right. So, so for, for starters, for starters, uh, very capable people who could only go into teaching 30 years ago <laughs> are now doctors and lawyers. Ah, right? okay. And chemists and scientists, for starters. Number two, um, a gap opened up between the preparing institutions and the receiving institutions. Um, and we haven't seen the kind of strategic collaboration and partnership we need to see between those two, those two worlds. Number three, compensation. The markets um, start 
you know, going after people who are talented and they pull them into more rewarding spaces. There's no one answer to your question, um, but there uh, are a series of things going on. Let's just call it in the education workforce. Uh, that have, have opened this problem up. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazukia Network. We are visiting with Dr. Kent McGuire, President and CEO of Southern Education Foundation. I'm flying straight to you. They call me Superman Lover. They call me the Superman Lover. Yeah. But I'm wrong. Something in the wrong. Funky Funky. Politics. In Memphis, there are 116,000 very important young minds. 20,000 of them attend schools in the bottom 5%. The Memphis Education Fund partners with committed organizations to give these students access to an equitable education. Their partners work to operate quality schools, recruit, retain, and develop effective teachers and leaders, ensure community voice, and support the needs of the whole child in Shelby County's priority schools. Hey, it's your Funky Politics crew here to talk to you about an exciting opportunities that are available for you at Southwest Tennessee Community College. Man, did you know a business degree can open doors to a wide range of opportunities? Engineering and information technicians are in demand to help power manufacturing and logistics. And paralegal studies, man, those majors are in big demand. Register now for spring classes starting January 17th. All you got to do is get off your couch, get on your phone and call them at 901 901- 333-4399. A wide range of programs for the most in-demand careers are just another reason Southwest Tennessee Community College is your best choice. This is the story of a great people, of hopes and dreams, of challenge and change. It's an American story. The story and struggle that started many centuries ago lives today in the halls and on the walls of the renovated National Civil Rights Museum. Enter the Supreme Court Halls of Justice, sit with Rosa Parks on the Montgomery bus, hear Mahalia Jackson sing at the March on Washington. Plan now to visit the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. For more information, log on to civilrightsmuseum.org. This is Terry Freeman. Jim Strickland. Dorsey Hobson. I'm DeAndre Brown. Melissa Househalter. Funky Politics. Funky Politics Show. Funky Politics. Funky Politics. Funky Politics. Y'all better keep listening. Funky Politics. Part of the Katsukian Network. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kajukia Network. In our studio this evening, we are visiting with Tequila Banks, Executive Vice President of TNTP, formerly known as the New Teacher Project. You got your boy DC here and Doc Ward, always on the mic. Yeah, so talk to us a little bit about TNTP. First of all, can I ask you this? Yeah. Welcome to the program. Thank Tequila. you. Thank you. Good to have a beautiful woman here instead of having this old bag of bones I work with every other day. But anyway, go ahead. Right your question, sir. Thank you. Uh, before I was so rudely interrupted, <laughs> rudely. talk to uh, talk to us a little bit about it, you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, TNTP was founded in 1997 by teachers, and the whole um, goal was to help districts that were you know having problems getting teachers to come to their districts. A lot of urban districts around the country. Um, so TNTP was formed by teachers to kind of meet that need, and so. At its for at its forming, that was the sole purpose to just recruit and train new teachers and then place them in districts that couldn't that didn't have enough teachers. Um, as time has evolved and we've continued to work with districts and states and chartered all over the country, we actually work not just in training new teachers. We work with districts on their instruction and curriculum work and academics. We work with them on their talent work still, and we also work with them on what we call supportive environments, making sure that they have policies and you know programs and structures in place. Place that would actually, you know, help help them deliver better, high quality education to kids. So, were you actually placing the teachers, or were you just giving them the training so that they could be placed? Both, because you're doing both, both of them. Both, and we still do some mm-hmm. of that, but it's not the only thing we do anymore. So, what was leading to the shortage? Because you know, we talk about this all the time: yeah. the teacher shortage. Why do we have such a a dearth of of teachers and educators right now in our systems? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. We've actually done some, you know, some research and some studies around it. One of the things is that colleges of education aren't producing as many teachers anymore. And once we started measuring, that's a part of it. We actually know which colleges are producing better teachers, so uh, fewer colleges are doing that. And then the other thing, we don't have as many teachers 
who actually go into teaching and stay. So if you look at retention, we have too many teachers, especially good teachers that are leaving the profession. Wow. Yeah, we, we've talked about it on this program before, and, and I, I'm, a, I'm one of those people who's going to always ask. Um, in terms of males in the classroom, and I and I like to speak to black males in the classroom, we've talked black, to— Black male in the classroom? <laughs> black men in the classroom. Black males in the classroom <laughs> that are that are, are leading the class, are, are actually the educators. Is there a strategy in place with any of these entities that are working with uh, performance measures to actively recruit— black males and especially some of these urban cores there are only a few to be honest there's wow. a there are only a few i mean that's been an effort i know for us to for us for other organizations that are that are doing this to increase the number of minority teachers in general but with a specific focus on black males um i think i would say we're making slow progress but not nearly enough wow. but but how do you get people how do you get people to be interested in teaching again? Because let's just be mm-hmm. let's just be for real. Yeah. You know, once upon a time, particularly in the African American community, yeah. being a teacher was the probably the the highest thing that you could be for yeah. the majority of folks uh coming out of college at that time, particularly folks that came out in the fifth forties, fifties and sixties. Yeah. Okay. So now all of a sudden you had other professions that became available mm-hmm. in the so called business world with integration of IBM and Xerox and all those other companies that started bringing in and said, let's take African-Americans, let's start integrating them. All of a sudden, working in a corporate in corporate America is more attractive than teaching. So now, you know, teaching is a job with, a, it's just categorized as a job with a lot of hard work and a lot of stress and low pay. So how do you get to a point to where you actually get those numbers up and then get the quality to go up, you know, proportionally with the numbers. I mean, that's 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 the question. I think is is bigger than just this school districts. A lot of you know people think, oh, if school districts would do a better job, that mm-hmm. is a part of the work. But if you look at countries where teaching is still a valued, noble, respected profession, where you know you're a star if you're a teacher, you don't see the crises and the shortages that we're seeing here. Where you go into it, it's rewarded both in pay and in recognition, and even how it's structured and what you ask teachers to do. Other countries, their whole value proposition around teaching is totally different from ours now. You are listening to Funky Politics, and this evening we are visiting with Tequila Banks, Executive Vice President of TNTP, formerly known as the New teacher project and you know and speaking about other countries and and you know if it comes down to it's a job or is it a profession and i think you just said a minute ago a job i think if teachers knew they were going to be supported these young people knew they're going to be supported and it was actually a career for them that they could see some upward mobility then maybe doc maybe uh I could probably stick it in, stick it, you know, maybe 10 years or 12 years in the classroom, and maybe I'm going to be, I don't know, something else, an administrator, I'm assuming. It's the next level. Well, that's part of the work that we do is helping helping districts and states figure out a better kind of career path for yeah. that. If you look at the average teacher salary, yeah. it takes teachers, you know, 10, 20 years to get to a, you know, more, a, a decent, more wage, and it's not connected to their performance. And so. Do you think that that's, do you think that that's fair? Do you think that's justified about the salaries? Do you do you think those salaries need to come up? Absolutely. I mean, what we ask for teachers. They, absolutely, they need to come up. Absolutely, they need to come up. Mm-hmm. And it should not take a teacher 30, 40 years to get to a salary that other professions start out at. So so first issue number one is that we're not paying teachers enough. I mean, can we just, can we kind of pull out some, some brass tacks? Well, yeah. Principles from this. Yeah. Number one, we don't pay teachers enough in America. Period. We don't pay teachers and, enough. And particularly those in public education. We don't pay teachers enough in America. Hmm. And particularly problematic, we don't pay reward teachers for being good. So if I'm a good teacher and I'm knocking it and my students are learning, I get the same pay as Miss Mary down the street well, who's just yelling at her class well, all you know, day. Well, funny you say that, Dr. Cool. I remember back in the day there was this career ladder out there. I think it was Career, career Ladder mm-hmm. 3. You know, mm-hmm. and it was almost a, a stratification mm-hmm. of sorts. Mm-hmm. Right. Can we not get to something like that where I can say that uh, Doc is now, he's a career ladder three. He's basically the supervisor. So, I mean, giving them something to mm-hmm. work toward and, you know, bumping up and pay five or six thousand dollars. I think this is a way to get there. Well, the two things, the two things that were problematic with the career ladder. One, 
it, it wasn't transparent enough. If you're going to pay by performance, everybody has to know what it takes and what yeah, it means to be good. Right, right. So Career Ladder was a little bit of a black box if you talk to people that were kind of in that system. And then the second thing, Career Ladder, frankly, ran out of money. It was funded by some special fund yeah. at the state level, yeah. and when that money ran out, it couldn't sustain. So if we're really going to change the game, we got to restructure the whole way we fund um Education, but not paying all teachers. the teachers the same thing because all don't perform at the same level, as you just yeah. said. Right. But I haven't so, even gotten into parsing it be, between teacher achievement. I'm saying teachers as a whole yeah. don't make enough money, period. Okay. So that, I mean, we agree. Before we start talking before we start talking about who's better and who's not better. So let's get to this. Because teachers in public education are funded by the government. And we're saying that teachers don't make enough money. You're saying they should make more. Where's this money going to come from to pay them? So it's interesting you say that. We we did a report a couple years ago called The Mirage. And what that report, the TNTP. Was the money in the Mirage? No, the money was not in the, <laughs> no, the Mirage. Mi- the money the was mi- a Mirage. The Mirage was the money? <laughs> yeah. Hey, here you go. God, that's not real. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> but, but what it found was, like, we, we tried to look at where are we spending a lot of money and what right. we're spending so much money on is professional development for teachers wow. that doesn't then translate into them being better. So on average, we this was a national you know, rigorous mm-hmm, study. Mm-hmm. And nationally, we spend about 18000 per year per teacher. Wow. 18000 per year per teacher. Mm-hmm. And that does not re- get a return on investment where those teachers are then getting better and better. In fact, we found most teachers kind of plateau around year five to seven. And you got, oh, I'm sorry. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. In our studio this evening, we're visiting with Tequila Banks, Executive Vice President of TNTP, formerly known as the New Teacher Project, and she is an education there reform guru. But when you guys got this consultant to come in and look, and they, they noticed that, that the, that the uh, professional development was not worth the money, uh, that you basically determined, I guess, that you could be taking that professional development money and putting it in salaries, right? That's one thing. And we're not saying you don't need to do professional right. development, but you should actually begin to return on it. You shouldn't yeah, be spending 18000 per year per teacher and mm-hmm. your teachers are still flat. They're like they're plateauing. They're not getting better and wow. better, yeah. meaning students are learning more and more. Well, next time somebody has this kind of study, I want them to hire me because I can tell you right now, you're spending billions of dollars on corrections. Oh. Billions of dollars yeah. on corrections. Yeah. Billions of dollars on corrections. Yes, sir, you for are. For kids that are not properly educated That's because right. of teacher shortage. Mm. And that same money that's going to give this person that's in the system. Or not an effective teacher in front of them. Well, I mean, I mean like I said before, two. I'm not even on the level well, of, okay. of, of, of whether or not they're effective yet. I'm just saying the general premise we said all teachers are underpaid. So we're spending all this money on corrections. And, you know, we're paying for somebody to have three meals a day and uniform and everything else. We could be taking that money and putting it on teachers as well. And it's pay and it's other things, too. We mm-hmm. we also did a national study on this teacher retention issue because we said, okay, we're not getting enough teachers to go into the field. Right. What about trying to hang on to the teachers we have? And in that pay was one of the things. There were some other things that came up for teachers on why they leave the profession. It's exactly as you mentioned, a lot of what were those? not feeling supported, yeah. not getting feedback, yeah. not getting any yeah. type of recognition. <laughs> so, it's the, I mean, it's the, it seems like it's all centered around pay. You know, how, how well do you show someone to love without you're not well, paying Well, in, interestingly, it you know? wasn't just pay. Yeah. I mean, pay comes up in like the top four, but not the top top reason that the teachers Isn't leave. That amazing? Teachers mm-hmm. leave because not, not working in schools where there's a good culture, meaning right. they do their job, they're recognized for yeah. it, they have a principal, sure. a manager who supports them and, you know, has their back. That's why most teachers leave. Wow. wow, this is amazing to me. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazukia Network. In our studio this evening, we're visiting with Tequila Banks, Executive Vice President of TNTP, formerly known as the New Teacher Project. Yeah. And and I guess that's where it comes from support. And I, and I had friends who taught school, and I had about two or three that left the district. New te- they were doing great, about six years, seven years, and eight, eight years, I think, just like that. Those three, they left, and they said, well, you know what? I can do something else. I mean, number one, I'm not really supported when I when I try to correct a student, then I get the parent involved, and then now it's back on me. So I, we're talking about a leadership issue in the building then, uh, in some respect, because if I don't have an effective leader in my building of the entire process, then I'm not going to get – I may just walk. I may walk when it comes down – when something small happens, Doc, I may walk. 
I don't know. I mean, it's not the check anymore because if you're teaching, number one, you ain't there for the money, no way. But you know what, though, a lot of times, and I'm not saying that teachers are, are in any way greedy at all. No, you know, I have a no, family no, no. full of educators. Yeah, but I think a lot of times, though, when you're showing people the love in the in the pockets, yeah, they're going to stick around, and decent people are going to do a decent job for yeah. a lot longer because at least they're being supported financially. But with these factors that you're talking about that are going on, pay being one of them mm-hmm. and then fulfillment being another mm-hmm. one, and there are other things to go on, are we getting to a point to where the teaching model is going to be we're going to train people to work for two or three years and get out, so therefore we have to give them sort of this box of skill for a shorter period of time because we know that they won't be here? Uh, or 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 what? Because I think before people train teachers for the long haul. Yeah, for the career path. Mm-hmm. So career now path. are we going to have to adjust the way we train teachers now because there's so many of them that are you know, there's such a swinging door effect to the I think profession? It's, I think it's twofold. I do think that our colleges of ed and, and other you know um, alternative certification programs need to step up and really look at how they're training teachers for the reality, right? This is the classroom. Yeah. But I also think, as you're saying, like what we – train teachers for we got to rethink that job I mean it's it's an untenable job frankly I mean like you I come from a family of educators my aunt was a principal at two different schools I mean yeah. could you imagine basically working two different jobs but you still get the same oh, wow. wait a minute hold on <laughs> two different schools yes I mean I, I was born in Memphis but I grew up across the river in rural Arkansas and wow. yeah and so it's things wow. like that I mean you're asking a person to right. drive 30 minutes between two jobs I mean but get the same pay and so when we think about mm. what it's going to take for teachers to stay in it for the long haul the current structure and model I, it's obviously not working no. we kids aren't getting what they need teachers aren't getting you know what they need so we just we really need to rethink and kind of crack that a whole thing crack that nut and figure out like what does the job for today's teacher need to look like that's sustainable and you got to figure it out pretty quickly, don't you? Oh, we need to figure it out pretty, pretty <laughs> because quickly. Because we got some babies right now. Right. Who, we who, have who some are, babies today. Who are, their lives are on the line. Yes. Today, their lives are on the line today, and they've got to be prepared for tomorrow. All right. So if the average teacher is going to – how long does the average teacher stick around the system now? Um, it's it's changing. Not the thirty years is getting lower and lower. I don't have the exact well, number. Well, obviously, it's it won't decreasing. be thirty years now no, because no. You, you, because at the same time you're also killing pensions and everything else. So yeah, right. no one's going to be able to get retirement. So need for me to stay anywhere for thirty years. But right now, how long do they stay? Would you say right now, if a teacher went to the system today? How long would it be before they went somewhere else? I mean, on average, probably anywhere, probably around ten years now. Mm-hmm. Um, in a lot of places, I mean, you can't quote me on yeah, that no, no, because no, it varies no. ballpark, by yeah. it varies right. by district. But we know, it's, we're just it's, a wag, is what yeah, we're getting from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So ten, ten years. years is so it's a ten year model that we need to be working with, or less. But but the thing is, we need to do a better job of keeping the teachers who are who are not doing it. Who are, who are doing right, it, right. but then the teachers who let's all be honest, there are sure. some teachers who need to be out of the district. Who should that's not what that shouldn't have been their career, and we need to help them, you know, respectfully find another career. <laughs> and so I like the way she said that. We need to help them respectfully find. Another career. Hey, I, mean, I agree. I was, a, I, was a so, I was a school social worker. So yeah, I understand. Still, like, we need a yeah. social worker out of there. there you yeah, go. yeah. It seems like we need a lot of social work. Right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, we do need a lot yeah. of. Social. Look, we're, you're listening to Funky <laughs> Politics, powered by the Kentucky Network. We're visiting this evening with Tequila Banks. Tequila Banks, God. Get, get it right. Get it right. Tequila Banks, Executive Vice President, <laughs> TNTP, formerly known as the New Teacher Project. We've take had a time, lot of fun man. here with you. Yeah. Take yeah. your time. Okay, take your time. Okay. Get, get it. Hey, back. This is Terry Freeman, Jim Strickland, Dorsey Hobson, I'm DeAndre Brown, Melissa Househalter, Funky Politics, Funky Politics Show, Funky Politics, Funky Politics, Funky Politics, y'all better keep listening, Funky Politics, part of the Katsukia Network. I'll play the blues for you. Blues in the Basement with Stephanie and T. Shaw. Some great festivals going on around the tri-state area. Got your dancing shoes? Man, as long as I'm with you, baby, I, I'm <laughs> always me on my toes. Drop that zero. Bring your blues, boo. <laughs> I got them. <laughs> we'll see you. Thank you. Blues in the Basement. The thrill is gone. Blues in the Basement, part of the Kentuckian Network. The thrill is gone away. 
R and R on sports with Eye Conversation. The executive director of the NBA Players Association, Miss Michelle Roberts. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. He is currently managing director and chairman of USA Basketball, Mr. Jerry Colangelo, with us here on R and R on Sports. Thank you guys. Nice to be with you. The one, the only, Detlef Shrimp. Hey, how are Larry? Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. Ken Griffey Jr. How are you today, sir? I'm good. How about you guys? Catch Eye Conversation on R and R on Sports, part of the Kentucky Network. Funky Politics Education Reform Series is presented by the National Civil Rights Museum, sponsored by Memphis Education Fund and Southwest Tennessee Community College. We'd like to thank our media partner, Chalk Beat Tennessee. Funky Politics from LPI Studios, we remind you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Stitcher, the world. We bring it to you, and we always bring it to you in a funky way. Special shout out to some people that have always been good to me. That police officer doesn't even know my name to help me get home from college back in Oxford, Mississippi that day. That firefighter that took care of my cousin's house that time when it caught fire on Christmas Day. Because all these people, if you notice, were working on Christmas. The day that's reserved for us to sit back and relax, they were at work serving us. So for those doctors, those public service workers, those folks that even work at Walmart and other retail outlets, go up to one of them and tell them thank you. That's how you know we're reaching each other and beginning to love each other. And with that love, that's the thing that ends crime. That's the thing that ends poverty. The ability for us to look at other options other than the worst option when we come into conflict, it can only be solved by the love that we share for one another. So as we come to the close of another Funky Politics episode and another year, we want to let you know that we're going to come back in 2017 right back at you like a firm fist to the jaw. But we're going to always be raw and we're always going to be real and we're always going to be right. But most importantly, we're going to always be funky. Funky Politics recorded live at LPI Studios Executive Producer Larry Robinson Music Curation Marcus Ward and Larry Robinson Design and Web by Daniel Coates Produced by Reggie Fine Happy Holidays from the Katsukian Network